Today we're going to talk about scarring. It's actually a video re a request from last week. Someone asked me, uh, Dr. Lamb, could you do a video on the difference between hypertrophic scarring and keloid? So really, I want you to think about the spectrum of scarring from atrophic, like holes or hollowness or stretched out scars. That's something like stretch marks. That's something like acne scars, where things are, are low and atrophic. We're not going to talk really about atrophic scars. It's a separate category, and we've got videos that talk about that. We're going to talk about the other extreme, which is big, exuberant, over thick scars that go beyond the flatness of a scar. So let's talk a little bit about what the difference is between a hypertrophic scar and a keloid. They are not the same thing. They're actually completely different, and the treatment uh, for each one is completely different. Part of what also in, uh, brought this on is I was taking care of a gentleman with a keloid last week, and I realized, you know, I, I have some videos to talk about this, but I really want to make this much more concrete. So they're both very thick scars, but they're completely different. Let's talk about how they are different grossly, microscopically, and clinically. Okay, grossly. The definition of a keloid is a scar that goes beyond the borders of the actual uh, area. So it's so overgrown, like a cauliflower, just overgrows well beyond the borders of the scar. One. The second, uh, so the difference is a, a hypertrophic scar does not go beyond the borders, but it's just thicker. It's a thicker scar. So that's a big difference. Let's talk about where keloids present on the body and where, to, where hypertrophic scars present. Hypertrophic scars can occur anywhere on the body, including the face, but a keloid, interestingly enough, really only occurs anywhere from the edge of the ear to the back of the head, from the top of the forehead to the scalp in the back. So in the central face, a keloid is almost literally impossible. I want to be careful with that, but as far as I know, it literally is almost impossible no matter what race you are, even African Americans, even uh, Hispanic, even Asians, etc. But a keloid can occur, like you see on the earlobes, those big lob, big balls there, or scars behind the, behind the hairline back here, or in shaving in the neck. Those things can occur and can create a big keloid. But in the central face, it's an area that tends not to be um, subjected to keloids. So if you see someone with a really thick scar on the face, most likely that's a hypertrophic scar. And so they behave completely differently, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But I just want you to understand location. Where does a keloid occur? Where, where does a hypertrophic uh, scar occur? And the, also the question then is why? The reason is that there's a lot of oil glands or sebaceous glands in, in the central face that allow the skin to heal very fast. The absence of sebaceous glands that occur in the rest of the body actually predispose toward keloid formation. But in the central face, a keloid really is literally almost impossible to have. It's very important you understand that. So just using scientific terms appropriately. When we talk about hypertrophic scars, the other thing that differentiates them on a microscopic level versus a keloid is that the collagen bundles, when you look at them, are straight aligned. When you look at a keloid, they're all over the place. They're disorganized. So when you look at it microscopically, there is something that qualitatively separates them other than, than just size and location. They're actually completely different animals. They're completely different uh, uh, entirely. So if they're histologically, that's under a microscope, different, if their location is different, and if their size is different, what else differentiates them? What's more important than that is clinically. How would you treat one versus the other differently? Well, let me explain to you. A hypertrophic scar occurs either due to a bad cut injury or just you know, bad closure of an of a incision or just very poor fortunate, uh, bad fortune as the person develops a thicker scar or hypertrophic scar. The best way to manage, in my experience, hypertrophic scars, either from laser treatments or from any of those things, is a more conservative approach using a combination of two treatment modalities. Um, one is KTP laser, and if you have a pulse dye laser, that's fine as well, but something in the 500 nanometer range where you can actually modulate the, the thickness of the scar and bring that down. So the laser is very, very effective for that. 5-fluorouracil, or 5-FU, is an injectable, and the difference from that and steroid injections, I think that is extremely safe in people of color or white individuals. It allows me to modulate the scar and bring it down. Ultimately, if the scar doesn't come out, you need, may need to excise it and then actually then treat it with a laser and 5-FU to prevent a recurrence, or sometimes just by cutting it out, you're fine. Now, 
how is that different from keloid? It's completely different. Uh, the keloid is that something that if you just cut it out and walk away from it, it'll blow up three to four times the size. You cannot just cut a keloid out. It must be managed afterwards. And how do you manage afterwards? Well, first of all, let's talk about just a big keloid. If you see a big keloid, injecting and injecting and injecting it probably is not going to make it go away, to be honest with you. It probably needs to be surgically managed. The problem with a keloid is if you surgically manage it and cut it out, you're sort of caught behind the eight ball in the way because if you just cut the, the keloid out, it will become much larger in size. Um, the gentleman I just worked on had a keloidic size and he, the doctor just left it there as a plastic surgeon. Actually, he's three times the size. So I set him up for radiation therapy. Now, let me go through exactly what are some of the options after surgical excision of a keloid? Because as I said, most oftentimes a keloid most often will not respond to conservative therapy of injections. But you can start with that. Injecting, um, and what would you do? And let's, let's talk about that order in a moment. So again, surgical excision usually is a mainstay. Then you move on toward uh, adjunctive therapy. So there's a division tree of what you should do. I did shoot a video on some of the details with radiation therapy, but let's go through that. If you're unfortunate you have a keloid and it's, it's just very, very enlarged and it's the, the, what I've described a keloid to be, then after surgical excision you have one or two decision trees. Radiation therapy or ongoing injections. Now when I do injections, I do laser therapies we talked about with a KTP with injectables. Now when I inject, 5-FU alone is not strong enough. I actually throw the kitchen sink at you and I use very intense doses of Kenalog or triamcinolone steroid that is, mixed with the 5-FU in to get the best results. Fine, but I will tell you that in my hands it repeat, it's, re, requires repeated injections. What you ultimately probably need is radiation therapy in many, many cases. Now, radiation therapy, let me just tell you a little bit about what that means. I have another video on that, but it's worth just repeating it in this context. One is the fact that radiation therapy is something that must be pre-planned with an excision of a keloid. If you say, well, let's cut it out and see what happens, you really have to go recut that keloid out in preparation for radiation therapy. And the reason for it is if you just sort of have a, a, a small keloid, somewhat injected, and you move to a radiation therapy, your success rate's about 50%. If you've got a massive keloid which you haven't even excised, and you go to radiation therapy, your success rate is extremely low. I don't know what percentage, but it's extremely low. And you should not subject someone to radiation therapy unless you give them the best chance at, uh, at a success. So what does that involve? Fresh excision and radiation therapy, I believe, I don't want to quote the exact centigrade, I think it's like 2,000 uh, uh, centigrade or, uh, t for, st for five consecutive days. You can skip a weekend usually if, if it if falls on a weekend. But you must plan ahead and have the keloid excised so that the radiation begins the, within 24 hours of excision. And that takes your success rate in most cases from about 50% success all the way up to about 95, 98 percent, so extremely high success rates. What are some of the limitations with radiation therapy? One is the fact that the area can become red, can be a little bit irritated just from side effects of radiation therapy. And there is an infinitesimal chance of actually having a malignancy in the area about 15 to 20 years later. I know that's devastating to even hear this, but the odds roughly, at what I've heard, is about 1 in 10,000. And that can be managed, obviously, for, with excision or whatever therapies. It's usually in the skin area that, and the radiation field that that can occur. The only reason I mention that is for the sake of completeness and for full disclosure and understanding this, so you understand everything that's involved. Hopefully, that's a good description between how, what the differences between a hypertrophic scar and keloids both being thicker and how, to, uh, how they present differently and how to manage each one.